and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before because they wouldn't stand up for themselves before because they weren't willing to undermine the protection. See, if you're protecting me, I can't bother you because I can't afford to forsake your protection. So if I'm going to play that game, I'm going to be hide behind you, then I can't challenge you. So that's no good because that's sometimes why people, you see this with guys very frequently, they're still deathly afraid of their father's judgment when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's like, well, why? Because well, they still want to believe that there's someone out there that knows. And so they're willing to accept the subjugation because it doesn't force them to challenge the idea that there's someone out there that knows. Because that's the advantage of having your father as a judge, right? Because he knows. Well, what if he doesn't? What if no one knows any better than you? Well, that's a rough thing. You don't, until you realize that, you're not an adult, right? That's really technically the point of realization of adulthood is that no one actually knows what you should do more than you do. I mean, it's a horrible realization because what the hell do you know? It's a terrible realization and people will often pick slavery, permanent slavery to the spirit of the great father, let's say, over that realization and it's completely understandable. But the problem with it is, is that there's more to you than you think. And so if you continue to hide behind that figure, then you never have a chance to understand that there's more to you than you think, far more to you than you think. Maybe there's enough to you so that you can actually withstand the threat of mortality without collapsing. Maybe even withstand the threat of malevolence without collapsing. Who knows? It's certainly possible. And it's not an abstract question. It's exactly the sort of question that you address in the psychotherapeutic process. It's, it's always the question that you address. And the answer is often in the affirmative because people can get unbelievably tough. And you know that because people work in emergency wards and hospitals, right? Or they work in, in uh, palliative care wards or they work as mortuary assistants. I mean, these people have bloody rough jobs, you know, or they're on the front line of police investigation into, you know, heinous child abuse crimes and so they're confronting malevolence on a regular basis and you know those are very stressful jobs but people do them and and some people do them without even being damaged by them although that's a harder thing because you can see horrible things you know things you'll never forget the problem is it's true you're oppressed you're oppressed you're oppressed you're oppressed god only knows why maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be or you know, your parent, your grandparent was a serf, likely, because almost everybody's grand great-grandparent was. It's like, you know, and you're not as smart as you could be, and you have a sick relative, and you have your own physical problems, and it's like, frankly, you're a mess. And you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology, and the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes! true okay but the problem is is that it is true and so if you take the oppressed you have to fractionate them and fractionate them and it's like you're a woman yeah okay well i'm a black woman well i'm a black woman who has two children well i'm a black woman who has two children and one of them isn't very healthy and then well i'm a i'm a hispanic woman and i have a genius son who doesn't have any money so that he can't go to university and you know i had a hell of a time getting across the border it was really hard on me to get my citizenship my husband is an alcoholic brute. It's like, well, yeah, that sucks too. And so, well, so let's, let's, let's fix all your oppressed oppression. And we'll take every single thing into account. And then we'll fix yours too. We'll take every single thing into account. It's like, no, you won't. Because you can't. You can't. It is technically impossible. First of all, you can't even list all the ways that you're oppressed. Second, how are you going to weight them? Third, who's going to decide? And that's the bloody thing. Who's going to decide? That's the thing. Well, what's the answer in the West? It's like in free markets. Oh, yeah, Christ, we'll never be able to solve this problem. No one can solve it. What are we going to do about that? We're going to outsource it to the marketplace. 
you're going to take your sorry, pathetic being, and you're going to try to offer me something that maybe I want. And I'm going to take my sorry, pathetic being, and I'm going to say, well, all things considered, as well as I can understand them, maybe I could give you this much money, which is actually a promise, for that thing. And you've packed all of your damn oppression into the price. And I've packed all my oppression into the willingness to pay it. And that solution sucks. It's a bad solution. But compared to every other solution, man, it's why 10% of us have freedom. And so there, there's a tremendous illogic at the bottom of this. It's like you have to fractionate the oppressed all the way down to the level of the individual. Well, that's what the West figured out. You know, there's a couple of figures who at the mythological roots of our culture and you know, people get upset with me because I bring in religious themes, but I understand some things about mythology and religion. And it's not an accident that the axiomatic Western individual is someone who was unfairly nailed to a cross and tortured. It's like, yes, right, exactly. So what do you do about that? Well, I thought about that for a long time too. It's like, well, you don't get together in a damn bob, because all that does is allow you to be as horrible as you could possibly imagine and suffer from none of the consequences. That's a bad idea. So how about we don't do that? Well, there's a deep idea in the West, too. It's like, pick up your damn suffering and bear it. And try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. Well, that's a truth, you know. I read a lot about the terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes. You have a lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah. No wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit, and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. So you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could, like, polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit, and then your eyes will be a little more open, and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more, and then maybe you could... Bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're like doomed to spend Christmas with. <laughs> so then you fix yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one. And then you got to figure out, well, can you figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother? And probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? And so then you, maybe you get somewhere that way and your family's sort of functioning and you find out, well, that kind of relieved a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so then you get your family together a little bit and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser and so then maybe you can put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. It's like... Our society is complex, and we teach our students that they could just fix it. It's like, go fix a military helicopter and see how far you get with that. It's like, what are you going to do? You're like a chimp with a wrench. Whack! Oh, look! It's better! It's like, no! 
it's not better. Things are complicated, and to fix things is really hard. And you have to be like a, a golden tool to fix things, and you're not. So, and that's the other message of the West. It's like, how do you overcome the suffering of, the, of life? And I'm not saying it's only the message of the West. How do you overcome the suffering of life? Is be a better person. That's how you do it. Well, that's hard. It takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. So you're going to have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares? And you can wander through life doing whatever you want, gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be. And you're stuck in meaninglessness, but you don't have any responsibility. Which one do you want? Well, ask yourself, which one are you pursuing? And you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing. Because, well, look what you have to do to do that. Yeah have to take on the fact that life is suffering. You have to put yourself together in the face of that. Well, that's hard. Christ, it's amazing. People can even do it. I'm stunned every day when I go outside and it isn't a, a riot with everything burning. Because really, God, you talk to people, it's like, I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him. And he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power. And he was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease. And, they had complementary inadequacies. And so two of them could do the job of one person. And so they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold, despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with a motorcycle accident. The other one has Parkinson's. It's like, that's how our civilization works. It's like, there's all these ruined people out there. They've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like. And look, the lights are on. My God, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And we're so ungrateful. College students, the postmodern types, they're so ungrateful. You know, they don't know that they're surrounded by just a bloody miracle. It's a miracle that all this stuff works. That all you crazy chimpanzees that don't know each other can sit in the same room for two hours sweltering away without tearing each other apart. Because that's what chimps do. 